The women's department has their own the way they raise money. The children's department has their own. It's the Buddy Barrels. They raise it through the Buddy Barrels. The youth group has their own way of raising mission. It's called Speed the Light. And they raise thousands, tens of thousands of dollars. I think Speed the Light, since uh, our inception in 1914, Speed the Light through youth groups, they've raised over $88 million. Just teenagers. So we have the best equipped missionaries in the world because our youth groups, teenagers, are sending money to these missionaries. And these dudes are driving nice cars. I mean, if they're in Africa, they're driving like Range Rovers. I mean, they're really doing great. And if they need a sound system, they got a sound system. If they need a printing press, they have a printing press. If they need anything, we'll get it to them. So that's really cool. So that's good stuff. So uh, we are, been, we've been going through a series. It's a book called in the gap. We've been doing the series and Chuck Webster preached one night on In the Gap and then I preached one night on In the Gap and Julie preached one night on Esther and how she stood in the gap, you know. And so tonight we have Colonel Mike Coggins is gonna speak to us. Yeah. Or you can just call him Mike. He's like my dad, he's so humble. Yeah, I love that. My dad was a full colonel and he said, Call me Skip. <laughs> but I like that though, don't you? Humble guys. And so, Mike is coming. Hey, Mike! Mike, Mike, Mike! <laughs> you like that commercial? <coughs> Mike's coming up. Let's give Mike a hand as he brings the word to Bless you. You know, as Pastor said, we've been studying the standing in the gap for the last, uh, I think it's three Wednesdays. And what we've been learning is that there are some key traits for what we call gap people. And in Nehemiah, we found out that he was a problem solver. You know, he looked at a problem, he found a solution for it, and you know, went forward in action with that solution. Then in Esther, we found out that she was someone who understood the times. She knew that God had called her to that place at that moment for a specific reason. And then we looked at Noah just the last Wednesday and found out that he was all in didn't matter what the cost. Yeah. So we're going to look at David tonight. And David's trait for us is that he was anointed by God or empowered by the Holy Spirit. Uh, so Pastor Few and maybe Matt will help you there. Go on and pass out some of the outlines. I think I should have enough for everybody. But if they're not, you can share with the person next to you. Just don't cheat. Don't look over at their answers. You know. <laughs> but before I begin the lesson, let's uh, open up with a word of prayer. Bow your heads with me. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come into your presence tonight together with your people and to be encouraged. God, we thank you that uh, for your word. For you told us that everything that was written in the past was written for our benefit. So that through the comfort and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. So Father, fill us with your hope tonight. Encourage and strengthen us through the word you bring to us. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, if you look at your outline there, I want to start with the setting of this in the first scripture. Bruce, you want to put it up? Uh, 1 Samuel 16, verses 1 and 13. And I've passed out some of these scriptures, so whoever has that, if you'll stand up and read it real loud for everybody. 1 Samuel 16, 1 and 13. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul? Since I have rejected him as king over Israel, fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed David in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, 
the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. Okay, let me give you a little context for the verse for those verses that were read. You know, the nation of Israel at this point in their history was in in a big mess. They were surrounded by enemies. In fact, they had the Ammonites that were to the west of them. They had the Philistines to the east of them. So they were being harassed and they were being attacked by each of these two groups of people. And even though Saul should have been a good leader, we find out through the Scriptures before this incident happened, that at every single turn, Saul proved his unworthiness to be the king of Israel, even though God had anointed him for that purpose. And what we find out is that Saul had some key uh, personality failings, if you will. And the first one that he had was that he was impatient. You know, there's a scripture that tells us that Samuel told Saul to wait for him for until he came to offer a sacrifice and basically dedicate Saul. And Samuel said, I'll be there. Well, Samuel didn't show up exactly when Saul thought he should, so Saul became impatient and took matters into his own hands. And then what happens, we see his next character flaw in that not only was he impatient, but he was arrogant. Because he went to offer the sacrifices himself. And he took upon himself some roles and duties and responsibilities that were not his to perform. Not only that, but we also find out in the Scripture that Saul was disobedient to God. God told Saul to go and to kill the Amalekites, to kill every single person, and to kill all their enemies, all their animals. And if you know the story, you know that they brought some of the animals back with them and that he spared the king. And of course, Samuel, when he saw it, was upset, took matters in his hands, killed the king anyway. But at that moment, God basically wrenched the kingdom from Saul's hand. You see, so it's for these reasons and even more that God rejected Saul as king and He sent Samuel on a new king-finding mission to the house of Jesse. Because God told Samuel that He had chosen someone who He was going to anoint as king. Now let's look at the selection process of that. You see, Samuel had all of Jesse's sons pass before him. And if you look at verses 5 through, I think it's about 12, it tells us that he went to the house, that he would, you know, was going to have a sacrifice, or Samuel was, he was going to have Jesse and all his sons come to that, he was going to consecrate them. And the plan was that Jesse would present each one of his sons before Samuel. But the thing is, he never got to all the sons to begin with. See, the first one to come in front of Samuel was Eliab. And when Samuel saw Eliab, you know what he said? Surely this must be the Lord's anointed that stands before me. But then God told Samuel that he had rejected Eliab. And then God gave Samuel a unique message about what God's really interested in. It's something that we need to hear. Bruce, you'll put up uh, verse 7. Samuel 16. And this is what it says. Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. You know, I don't think you have to look far to realize that our society is pretty obsessed with outward appearance. I mean, we are inundated, we're bombarded with commercials and magazines and billboards and radio and, and television with the externals. In fact, we're prodded in all of those to, uh, to get fit. You know, we're prodded to lose that uh, belly fat. I mean, how many women's magazines, every time you see them in the grocery store, how to lose those five pounds of belly fat, you know? Or they're talking to the men, you know, how to get rid of that spare tire. Or how to get ripped. How to get fit. How to get in shape. You know, how to lose weight. And then they also try to prod us to wear the latest fashions or styles that are out there. And if we're not happy with the way we look and we're getting a little bit older, then they also prod us to restore our youth to us. To look younger, you know. And there's Botox and there's 
plastic surgery, and, and I'm not going to ask who's had that. But there's all kind of things. But, but the point is, it's focusing on the externals. But God lets us know in these verses that He is concerned about the heart. You know, it tells us that David was a man after his own heart. If you know anything about the story of David, you know that David was far from perfect, wasn't he? Like there were times, when, numerous times, when David messed up. But what we find out about David is that he was humble in the midst of all that. And that he was always willing to confess his sins, to get right with God, and to ask God to give him or recreate within him again a clean heart. See, God is concerned about our heart as well. Well, Jesse had seven of his sons pass in front of Samuel. And God told Samuel that he had rejected or refused every single one of them. So Samuel looked at uh, Jesse and said, hey, don't you have any more sons? Don't you have any more? And of course, Jesse finally admitted it. He said, yeah, there remains one more, the youngest, and he's out tending the sheep. Well, I find that interesting. You know, if you're the youngest sibling out of two or three or four or five or how many, then you've probably been treated like David was treated. I mean, they didn't even give David the time of day. He wasn't even invited initially to the anointing party that was going to happen. And not only that, his father nor his brothers considered him. They considered him so little that it didn't even cross their line that David could be a candidate for king. So they left him out tending the sheep. They ignored him. They dismissed him as if he wasn't even there. You know, no matter how insignificant or incapable others may think we are. God chooses us anyway. And not only did God choose us, but He can do great things in us and through us in spite of whatever failings we might have. Uh, somebody have 1 Corinthians 1, 6-29. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose, chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. <coughs> God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before Him. You know what that scripture says to me? is that we shouldn't focus on our lack of ability. We shouldn't focus on the talents that we don't possess. We shouldn't focus on the money that we don't have. Because, you see, those things don't concern God at all. But God chooses us, warts it all, with our own uniqueness, so that He can use us for His purposes and for His glory. I mean, if you think about it, it's really not about us anyway, is it? It's about Him. And God desires to be glorified in and through us. Well, let's look at uh, 1 Samuel 16, verse 13, about David being anointed and empowered. Who has that? <clears throat> I think it's the one who had the first verse. Can you want to just read that? So Samuel took in. the horn of oil and anointed David, anointed David in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. See, God chose David, and then God empowered David to do the work to which he had called. And that was to be the shepherd and the king of Israel. And God does the same for us. When He chooses us, He doesn't leave us to our own devices. But He gives us the ability that we need. He gives us the gifting and the grace that we need. And He empowers us with the Spirit, just as He did David, to do the work 
that God has called us to do. You know, I'm from North Carolina, and in our state we have some stories just like other states do. There's one that's been told that I've heard a number of times about this uh, old farmer who went to the local general store and bought a new chainsaw from one of his friends. You see, he'd never had one of those before, and he, and he took it home and cut a whole cord of wood. Well, toward the end of the day, when his friend got off work and happened by his farm because he lived near it, he saw his friend out there just dripping with friend, with sweat. So he stopped his car and, and said, well, hey, how'd you like the new saw? Of course, he wiped his brow with uh, his hanky and said, you know, it's all right, but uh, I don't think it's any better than my old one. So his friend said, well, let me see it. And he grabbed the saw and he pulled the cord and it roared to life. And of course, then his friend just jumped back and startled and looked at him and yelled, what's that noise? <laughs> you know, a lot of times people try to live the Christian life without power. Yeah, yeah you've seen it. and In fact, you've probably done it. Even though you might not admit it. You know, I've done it. Where we try to do things in our own wisdom or with our own gifting and talents and our own strength and and what happens is that in the process of that, we can become worn out and frustrated. Because it just doesn't work as God intended it to work. You see, we've got to have that power flowing through us, and that's the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit needs to fill us to give us the power to do what God needs us to do and wants us to do. If you're looking at your outline, there's a few verses that we have that deal with the Holy Spirit's filling. You know, it tells us in Luke 4, 1, that Jesus was full or filled with the Holy Spirit. And being filled, He was led out into the desert where He was tempted, where He fasted for 40 days and was tempted of the devil. Right? Well, you see, it was that filling, that fullness, that power of the Spirit in Christ that enabled Him to fast that time as well as to defeat Satan with all the wiles that He came against Jesus with. If you were looking at Acts 2.4, it tells us that on the day of Pentecost, when the disciples were gathered, that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke in other tongues. You see, it was the filling of the Holy Spirit that empowered them to speak in languages they didn't know and understand, but the people to understand so that they could be saved that day. It was the power to witness for Christ. And if you look at Acts chapter 6, we find out that they were looking for someone to help wait on tables to take care of the widows. And they found Stephen and said he was a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> then if you continue with Stephen's story and you get to chapter 7, what you find out is that it was the power of the Spirit in him that enabled him to confound the religious leaders with his wisdom as well as to suffer stoning to death without fear, but in full confidence in God. You know, the rest of the book of Acts records for us miracles and deliverances and healings and, and all kind of other great things that God did through His people who were filled with the Spirit. And I want to equate being anointed and empowered by the Spirit with being filled with the Spirit. Look at Ephesians 5, 18. Bruce, put that up and whoever has that will read. <coughs> now, do not get drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery, but rather be filled with the Spirit. You know, English might not have been your favorite class in school, but stay with me for just a couple of minutes while I bring up some important grammatical observations about this particular verse and the verb there that says, be filled. You see, in your outline, you'll see where I'm going with this. If you look at that one verb, you find out that it's in the imperative mode. 
if you remember English from your high school days, imperative means a command. You see, being filled with the Spirit is not an option for us, but it's a command to us. It's not a nice to have in the Christian life, but it's a necessity and a command that's addressed to all believers. Second aspect of that verb is that it's in the plural and not singular. And what that means is that it's addressed to every single one of you. It's not just for the pastor, it's not just for super saints or super spiritual people, but it's for every single believer. All of us are commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Third thing about that verb is that it is in the passive voice. And that means that the object, which is us, we don't take the action. But something is acted upon us. You see, what that means is that we don't fill ourselves with the Holy Spirit. But rather, we just put ourselves in a position that the Holy Spirit can fill us and empower us. God does the filling, not us. And the last thing about this verb is that it's present tense, which means it's continuous action. And even though it's not grammatically correct, you could translate this, be being filled with the Holy Spirit. In other words, continually be filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, it's not just a one-time event or a one-time deal that happens at the altar with a single decision. But it's a repeated event. The more we yield our lives to God, the more we consecrate ourselves to God, the more we surrender areas of our life to God, the more God fills us with His Spirit and His power. And it can happen over and over and over again. Unlike the baptism, it's a repeated event in our lives. We're to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But you know, that doesn't happen automatically. If you're following in your outline, there are some conditions to being filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, it's not mechanical. And we can't reduce being filled with the Holy Spirit to a set of three steps or ten steps or twenty steps. But there are some conditions that we all need to meet if we're going to be filled by the Spirit of God. And the first of those, following your outline, is desire. In other words, you got to want it. Yeah. You know, there were some football coaches and basketball coaches and even baseball coaches, and what happens is if their team is not doing so hot in the first half, and they have that halftime huddle, that halftime meeting, you know, a lot of times those coaches are just going to say, guys, you got to want it. you got to want it. And the same thing is true with the Holy Spirit. We need to desire to be filled if we really want God to fill us. Somebody have John chapter 7? You do? Would you read that for us? On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Give me my thirsty and I'm coming to you again. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from you. Our gifts in the Spirit, who those who believe in Him were able to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit has not been given, and the people have not yet been glorified. Did you hear the passion from Jesus in those words? If anyone thirsts, let him come. And there's also the promise He'll fill us with those rivers of living water that are going to flow through us. You know, the question that came to me as I was studying this and I want to put out for you is, are you thirsting for more God? You know, it's so easy as we walk through our daily lives and we get caught up with work or family issues or any number of other things. It's easy to settle for the status quo. For business as usual. For the mediocre in our Christian life. And not really desire more. We, just, we show up on Wednesday and we get what we get. We show up on Sunday and we get what we get. And then the rest of the other six days a week, we're just doing what we want to do. Or five days a week, we're doing what we want to do. The question is, if you really want to be filled on a continual basis, you've got to want it and desire it from God. 
Not only that, but we need to deal with sin. It's the second condition. You see, what happens is that sin grieves the Holy Spirit, who's the one who empowers us. And it short-circuits the power of God that needs to be flowing through our lives. Somebody have that scripture in Psalm 66, verses 17 to 18? If you do, you want to read that? I cried out to him with my mouth. This phrase was on my tongue. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. You know, the late President uh, Calvin Coolidge uh, returned home from church one Sunday and his wife couldn't go because she was busy and she asked him you know, what the preacher had preached about and all he said was sin. Uh, she knew her husband was a man of few words and so she kept prodding and pressing him to tell her more and finally in exasperation he said, well, I think he was against it. <laughs> you know, when it comes to sin, the Holy Spirit's against it. Because the Holy Spirit, that's not just the title, that's His name. That's who He is. And when we sin, it grieves and it short circuits His power in us. And like David, we need to keep short accounts with God. You know, if we have some lingering sin that's in our life, we need to deal with it through confession and repentance so that circuit can be restored again. Well, there's another condition, that third D there, and that is dedication or dedicate. You see, we have to consecrate ourselves to the Lord as well. Who has Romans 12, verse 1? Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. You know, when Christ came to save us, what we find out in the Scriptures is that because of that, we're no longer our own. But we're His. Because we've been bought with a price. You know, there are times, though, that even though we've been bought, and even though we're not His, or even though we're not our own anymore, we're His, that we still think we're our, our own. And there are things in our life that we hold back from Him. You know, maybe closets in our house. In our physical house, body. Areas that we don't want Him to see, that we don't want Him to mess with, that we don't want Him to get into. And all those things can thwart the work of God's Spirit in us. You really need some wholehearted consecration to God. Give your whole body as that living sacrifice. And it's in that surrendering ourselves that we give the Holy Spirit an open invitation to come in and fill us and empower us. Well, now let's get back to David for a minute. It's important to see that David not only stands in the gap for Israel and fighting uh, Goliath, but he could only do that after he was empowered by the Holy Spirit. See, I never put two and two together. But uh, chapter 16 comes before chapter 17. Lisa does in my Bible. You see, God anointed David and empowered him in the Holy Spirit then he fought the giant. Don't try to fight giants without being filled with God's power. Okay. Uh, let's look at the, the. I want to look at chapter 17 now. We're going to jump into that story of David filling the gap. Now that we know he's he has God's spirit, so that he can step into that gap. Let's look at First Samuel chapter 17, and someone's got the first 11 verses. You want to go ahead and read that for us? Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war in the temple at Soko. They put his camp at Ephes Damim, between Soko and Azekah. Saul and the Israelites assembled in camps in the valley of Elah, and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill, and the Israelites another, with a valley between them. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, Gath came, from, came up the Israelite camp. He was over nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs he wore bronze greaves, and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted it to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? I am not a Philistine. Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? 
Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistine's words, Saul and the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. So what you have is the battle lines that have been drawn. you got the army of the Philistines on one side of the valley, on a mountain. you have the army of Israel on the other side. And for 40 days, this giant has been taunting the army of Israel. And for 40 days, Goliath is the only one who has stood in the gap between the two. I mean, he was massive. You know, the NIV says he was over 9 feet tall. If you read it in other translation, it says exactly he was 9 feet 9 inches tall. So, if we want to get just an idea of what that is, uh, think about a regulation basketball goal. Anybody know how high that is above the court floor? Ten feet. Exactly ten feet. So if we had a basketball hoop in here, ten feet up in the air, and Goliath came and stood under it, his entire head would be up in the basket behind the net. And he would only be three inches shy, the top of his head, from the metal ring. I mean, think of it if he was on your team, man. He'd make every slam dunk and he wouldn't even have to jump. You know, I mean, he was really massive. And you may not get all that said about shekels and how much it weighed, but let's put it in our language. His armor that he wore weighed 150 pounds. The tip of the spear that he used weighed 20 pounds. I mean, not only was he massive proportionally to his height, but he had the weapons to match that. I mean, in every sense of the word, he was a giant. And his presence was so daunting that it filled the army of Israel with fear. The scripture says that they were, they were dismayed and terrified in fear. And it's into that scene that David comes. So where's David been? Well, since God anointed him, he's had two jobs. Feeding the sheep for his dad. But his other job was playing the harp for Saul playing music for Saul. So he was kind of bouncing between those two different jobs, but he'd just come out of the field feeding sheep, and his dad said, hey, go take some supplies to your brothers who are fighting in the war. So David shows up on the scene with a picnic lunch for his brothers, and he hears the giant. And you see, David takes that not only as an affront to the army of Israel, he takes it as an affront to the God of the army of Israel. And it really got David's dander up. And he heard some of the men talking about, hey, you know, the person that kills this guy, you know, man, the king's going to award him. You know? So David starts asking questions. And then his brother Eli shows up again. Somebody have verses 28 through 30 of this chapter. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, Why have you come down here? And the reason you leave those few sheep in the desert. I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Now what have I done? said David. Can I even speak and then turn away to someone else and brought up the same matter and the men in your hand up before? Have you ever been put down? <laughs> Patronize, belittle, <coughs> discount. You know, I'm sure this was not the first time that David's brothers did this to him. I mean, he grew up, he grew up with seven older brothers putting him down all the time. I mean, if you go back to his anointing, they didn't even think enough of him to bring him in for the sacrifice of the anointing party. That's how little they thought of him. And, I mean, you can hear the frustration <laughs> the frustration in David's words. What have I done now? Can I even speak? You know, I, I don't know how many times I've heard almost the same kind of comments made in my family. Most of the time by my little sister, who always felt put down by the other four of us who are older than her. You know, but you hear in David this frustration, but he doesn't let his brother's words deter him. All David does is he turns to 
others who are around and begins asking more questions about what the king is going to do. And, and what happens is David's inquiry came to the attention of Saul and Saul summoned David into his presence. And what's interesting is that when David comes into his presence, at least according to the Scripture, Saul's not the first to speak, though he should have been as the king. David is the first one to speak. And he says this, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine, for your servant will go and fight him. But even those words are met with disdain and doubt on the part of Saul. Because Saul looks at him and says, you are not able to go out and fight the Philistine. You are only a boy. And he has been fighting a fighting man from his youth. In other words, you're just a pipsqueak. You're not a warrior like me. You're not a warrior like him. You're not a warrior like anybody that's in my camp. Who do you think you are that you can go out and fight him? But again, David was not deterred by Saul's words. And gave Saul a great response. Somebody's got verses 34 to 37. But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off the sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from his mouth. When it turned on me, I beat it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the army of the living God. The Lord delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, but delivered me from the hand of this Philistine. What I get from that is that David had a personal, intimate relationship with God before he ever encountered Goliath. You see, you don't, you don't just talk like that off the cuff. You don't shoot from the hip. You don't have a personal relationship. You can't talk like that. He knew God. God had been with him to deliver into his hands both a lion and a bear. And I'm also sure that during the nights when David was out tending his sheep, that he took his harp along with him. Now, don't get confused. Don't think of one of these big harps that you see people wielding here that are almost as big as a grand piano. I mean, back then they had one that was only eight strings in it. Very small, compact kind of harp. But you see, David had been a musician all his life, and when he was anointed, that's one of the things that Saul wanted him to do, was play on his harp. So I'm sure that while David was tending his sheep, he was playing his harp, composing songs and singing to God. And you know we have a whole book of David's songs that he wrote in the book of Psalms? I've written down a few in your outline just for you to look at. Psalm 61, it says, Turn, O Lord, and deliver me. Save me because of your unfailing love. Psalm 13, 5 says, But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. In Psalm 18, 1, David responds and said, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. So David's words, or David's relationship with God was based on the unfailing love of God and David's love for God as well. You know, I think that David had his courage and his strength to not only face the bear and the lion, but to face the lion. And they came out of his confidence in his unswerving confidence in the unfailing love of God for him. And I think that should be the same for us as well. That we should have our cur the same kind of courage, the same kind of strength that comes from the same kind of confidence that David had in God's unfailing love for us. Look at Romans uh, 8, 35-39. I know that somebody has that scripture as well. Okay. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship, persecution or famine, or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors 
through him who loves us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You hear that great truth in verse 37? We are more than conquerors. More than conquerors through Him who loved us. I think what we need to realize from this is that God's power doesn't come to us or doesn't exist in a vacuum. But it only comes to us in the context of a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. You can't have the Holy Spirit without first having Christ in your life. You can't have the Holy Spirit without first having that personal relationship with God. And it's knowing that God's love was demonstrated on the cross when Christ died for us. And His power was demonstrated when Christ rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. And Christ shows that He loves us by giving us His Spirit into our hearts. So that relationship is first base. You know, I think there are a lot of times that people want a lot of things from God. They want God to fix this or fix that or fix that, but they don't want God. They just want stuff from Him. Blessings from Him. They want Him to be a fix-it man in their lives. But it all starts with a personal relationship first. I want us to read uh, chapter 17 and kind of finish up this with verses 40 through 52. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and that he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his God. Come here, he said. And I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I'll give you the carcasses of the Philistine army, the birds of the air, and the beasts of the earth. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that, that, that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, but for the battle is the Lord's, and He will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to, to attack him, David ran toward, quickly toward the battle lines to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sunk. Uh, sank in the, his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling of stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. And David ran up, ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from its scabbard. After he killed him, he cut off his head with a sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. You know, in spite of the naysayers, his brothers, and even King Saul, David went on the offensive and ran toward the giant. Let me ask you a question. What giants are you facing right now? Are there some giants in your own personal life? In the lives of some of your family members or friends or, or even in this community? I don't want you to be too quick to answer. I want you to think about it for a minute. Don't make too many assumptions. Because something you may have passed over as we read through these scriptures is that, you see, David saw and heard everything that the army of Israel saw and heard. They responded in fear, but David responded in faith, knowing that this giant was his giant to slay. 
You know, you may not be called to kill every giant. You know, that may be somebody else's battle. But there's some giants that God wants you to face. And there are some people that are cowering in fear and are paralyzed just like the army of Israel was. And they're waiting for some champion to go ahead of them and take the fight to the enemy. Are you going to be that person? Are you that one who wants to stand in the gap? And take the power of God with you because that power is in you to defeat the giants. Let's all stand to our feet.